If you would take your Bibles, please, and turn to the New Testament book of Romans. It's one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the first century church, the saints who were living in Rome and gathering there, worshiping probably in a very similar fashion to how we are worshiping here this morning, uh, although minus the technology, all right? Romans 15 is where we'll be resuming in just a moment. I'll come to that text uh, in just a, another minute here. I did want to thank you for your prayers as I made a quick trip uh, leaving Thursday morning. Uh, many of you were hearing, and thank you for your prayers uh, as I made the trip for my uncle's funeral. That was Friday afternoon and was able to travel home yesterday. Uh, it was a, a great blessing to be a part of that memorial service uh, to preach the gospel, as uh, has often been a privilege. He was my dad's only brother, and my dad, who is 85 years old now, my uncle was 75, uh, they, were, they were not close early on, as you can imagine. A 10-year gap when you're little seems insurmountable, but uh, they had certainly grown very close in recent years. I'm thankful most of all that my uncle's testimony was crystal clear. Nobody had to wonder about what he believed, where his faith was, what he was living his life for. And uh, I was thinking that uh, each time we go to a funeral, as the book of Ecclesiastes says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting because wise people lay it to heart that as they consider, you know, this is where I'm going one day. How am I living my life? And will I be prepared for the day of my death when it arrives? But I do appreciate your prayers and... Um, thankful to, to be back here. You know, children don't always uh, live life the way we want them to. A mother tells a tender story illustrating this. I read this uh, earlier this week. She writes, when our son was about three, we discussed the importance of looking both ways before crossing the street. We had a dog, Flower, who loved to play in the yard of our rural home. One day, Flower got away and was hit by a car. We carried her into the lower level of our home, awaiting the veterinarian's arrival. Sadly, she passed away. I explained to our son, our three-year-old, that Flower did not look both ways before crossing the street. After a few minutes, I asked him, what is mommy trying to teach you? He quickly responded, don't die in the basement. I suspect in time the three-year-old learned the real lesson. Uh, we laugh at things like that, and those of you who have three-year-olds laugh and kind of sigh at the same time. It's hard work to get a young and immature, underdeveloped mind and heart, you know, to that place of maturity. But we bear with that innocence. We bear with that naivete. We bear with some of that foolishness in the great hope and expectation that as we walk side by side in love, instructing, disciplining, correcting, doing all those things that are necessary for little ones, that they won't stay little either physically or mentally. And I think that that story illustrates humorously some of the challenge that we as a body of believers are always in as we're seeking to help one another in this journey of life. We've been in Romans 14 and actually taken two different sermon slots to break it in half and look at what Paul says in that particular chapter about welcoming one another. And the command is to receive one another, open your heart to one another, but not for the purpose of quarreling about opinions. That's chapter 14, verse 1. That's where we started. And then he walks us through that, reminding us that there are weak uh, believers and there are strong believers, weak faith believers, strong faith believers. The reality is that we're all weak in some ways and strong in other ways, but his point is, when it comes down to the opinions that we hold, even those that are motivated by a desire to honor God that we would personally say are rooted in our understanding of the scriptures, things that God has not spoken definitively about must never become the points of contention, quarreling, argument, and fighting. It's important to keep 
the main thing, the main thing. So we've spent the last two messages working through Romans 14. Now, in your uh, copy of the scriptures, whether you're looking at a printed copy or an electronic copy, there's a chapter break after verse uh, 23 of chapter 14, and in some ways it's not helpful because Paul is actually continuing the thought, and we sometimes read chapters in the Bible the way we read chapters in novels. But that's the, the chapter numbers and even the verses are given just to kind of make it a little more manageable. So rather than even this morning as I began saying, turn to Paul's letter to the Romans and you need to go about mm, you know, five, six of the way through and you know, it just helps us to say, turn to Romans 15. So as I read through this in just a moment, I want you to carry Romans 14 kind of stuff forward and I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that a number of you are visiting with us today for the first time or some of you haven't been here for several weeks and may not have been able to hear those uh, sermons that we worked through previously. So Paul has been making this case that we should receive one another, open our hearts to one another, not to quarrel, not to pass judgment on one another, not to despise one another, but we care for one another. And these are the thoughts that we carry now into chapter 15, verse 1. So you follow along, please, as I read. The words are printed on the screen for you, too. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, uh, you can follow along uh, on the screen. This is the word of the Lord. The Apostle Paul writes, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Pray with me, please. Now, Father, as we Open your word together again on this day. We give you thanks. This is the living, abiding word. Your spirit breathed it out through men of old. Breathed it out in order that we might know truth, that we might be changed by it, that we might be instructed and encouraged and built up in it. Oh, how we ask, Spirit of God, that you would bring our thoughts under your sweet control so that as you reveal our sin, we would confess it and turn from it immediately. That as you reveal to us your will, we would believe it and embrace it that we might obey it. And that you would illuminate our minds because they are darkened with false notions about who you are and what your plan is that you would drive away every evil thought and cause us, cause us, Lord God, to know you as you are. We're so thankful for the privilege that we have to open this word. And as we treasure it, we pray that we would be transformed by it. Would you let your blessing rest upon all those who gather in your name today, who open the word in hope and expectation, would you pour out your spirit as the word is preached and taught both here and around the world? Would you cause it to bear the beautiful fruit of repentance and faith that we might see your church grow, that we might see the nations transformed? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 1 with me again, and notice there are two groups that Paul uh, reminds us of again, though he uses a little different terminology here. He says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. 
And in its simplest expression, the word strong has the idea of those who are able. Those who are able to live the Christian life and do the kinds of things that we've been looking at in chapter 14. And then there are others who are not able. They don't have the strength within themselves. Their faith hasn't grown to that point. You know, picture a three-year-old again. They're limited in what their ability and capacity is. You don't typically see three-year-olds mowing the yard, but some three-year-olds are learning to make their bed. That's a good thing, a reasonable thing. So a three-year-old is weak in certain ways, unable to do things, and Paul's not criticizing at this point. He's just establishing and reminding us that there are two groups that are in, in view. Now notice the first command for the strong because this does come under this greater heading of Christ's love being what obligates us to one another. And Paul makes the point here that the strong should bear with the failings of the weak. He actually uses the word we have an obligation that's a term that's uh, translated in other places than the scriptures as a debt. You have a debt. Who are you indebted to? Well, chiefly Christ. It's a debt of love because of his great love for us. And we have an obligation, look at the text again, Paul says, to bear with the weak. That is to endure something that honestly is unpleasant. It's hard, difficult. Again, I, my, my mind and heart just kept going back to parenting again and again. Even, even ministry in the context of the church with little ones. We put up with all kinds of things uh, recognizing that they're not yet full grown physically, mentally, emotionally. I mean, children have meltdowns. We bear with that. We're not happy about it. Some of you parents have, and it always seems to happen in a public place, right? I mean, that's not the only place it happens, but the worst ones happen in public. Aisle three of the grocery store. And you feel like everyone in the store comes running to that aisle to see you know, this, this meltdown, this catastrophic event. Well, that's actually the kind of thing that Paul is talking about. You, you are obligated, for Christ's sake, to bear with those who are weak. This term is used in the Gospels in a, in a really wonderful setting and story of our Lord. In Matthew 8, Jesus has been uh, healing, working extremely hard with the disciples. Verse 16 tells us that even at evening, when you, know, you should be like knocking off work, having dinner, getting a little rest and relaxation, but in, in this particular evening, Matthew writes that they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word. He healed all who were sick. And then Matthew inserts this really powerful note. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Those are physical weaknesses that even have spiritual ramifications, often negative ones. The Lord is not asking us to do anything for one another that he himself has not done for all of us. Matthew is quoting Isaiah 53. Now, if you look again at the, at the text in Romans 15, what Paul is speaking of here, bearing with the failings, very specifically, this has to do with those, those scruples, those concerns, those places of, of tender conscience for uh, some believers. And in, in the church at Rome, it had to do with eating meat that potentially was tainted. And there were Jewish believers there who had grown up with a really strict dietary consideration. They were doing it in honor to God. And even though at, through Christ's life and ministry, he had overturned or fulfilled specifically all of those Old Testament requirements so that all foods were now clean and acceptable, there were some who hadn't yet figured that out, hadn't grown in faith to that point. That's one particular example that Paul gives us. And he actually describes these as failings. Now, it's not a failing in sin. It's a failure to understand the fullness of God's truth. And so their consciences are restricted in a way that God doesn't intend. And the Lord is saying, you who are strong, you need to bear with those failings. Their differences of opinion as to what our Christian life and service and ministry ought to look like. So that's, that's big point number one. The second is this, that the strong are to consider the weak. Notice how he goes on to say that the strong should not please themselves. Not to please himself. 
This has the idea of giving consideration for weaker Christians, letting that consideration take precedence over what we ourselves would like to do. Now, this does not mean that the weak suddenly be, you know, take control of everything, that we just kind of find the lowest common denominator and settle there and never move off of it. No, as one author writes, they have only to express a scruple and, or, or it would be wrong to think that they only have to express a scruple and everybody would rush to conform. That would mean that the church would be permanently tied to the level of the weak and that life and growth would cease. I, I'm actually thankful that the, there are three-year-olds in this church. We don't all have to live and think and act like three-year-olds when we gather. That would be bizarre at best and scary and frightening at worst, Right? Well, similarly in the church. So the, war, the Lord, when he tells us we ought to please our neighbor, he's not, he's not talking about a people-pleasing kind of thing. That's actually condemned outright in places like Galatians 1 and Colossians 3. So we're, this is not a modern understanding of what it means to please someone else that we're bringing to bear because that, that would probably reduce to, well, whatever, else, whatever somebody else wants you to be or whatever somebody else wants you to do, that's it. Well, that is a form of pleasing, but that's not the concept that Paul has in mind here. A biblical understanding of pleasing your neighbor has to do with, um, as needed in this present moment, to adapt ourselves to fit who they are and where they are. Again, it's what some of our children's workers are doing right now. They're taking Bible lessons and truths from God's word and putting it right down to the level where little ones can understand them. In time, their understanding will grow, and, and so will their vocabulary, and so will the, the depth of lessons that they will be given, but we do this because God is making our hearts soft and tender toward one another. It's his love at work in us, and that's what compels us to not please self, but to please our neighbor. Typical human thinking runs along this line. Well, you ought to adapt to me. But that's not Christian thinking. Or sometimes we would say, well, they ought to adapt to us. That's not the direction that the Lord is taking us. Bible author Leon Morris has written, a genuine concern for the weak will mean an attempt to make them strong by leading them out of their scruples so that they too will be strong. And that's where Paul goes in this next line. Look again at your Bible. So we don't please self, but we work for his good. Now, Paul is going to explain that in the very next phrase. What does it mean to live or work or consider, be considerate for his good? Look at the next phrase. To build him up. To strengthen him. To take that person from a place of, of, of small or even imperfect understanding to mature understanding. To help grow them from a place of, of maybe stilted practice to full, mature, faith-filled practice. Think of how often we adapt our language to the level of a little one. We're happy to do that, knowing that as the vocabulary grows, we'll have adult conversations. One of the great joys of of parenting right now, our youngest just turned 20 several months ago, so we have no teenagers. Um, You know, they're all 20 and older, and parenting has its challenges now. I don't want to, we're not on easy street. I think we pray more now than ever. We often talk about that, right, honey? Um, but we also have a different kind of conversation now than when they were really little. I remember one years, years ago with our oldest, who's 27, and he was just a little guy, and, and uh, we were coming home from church one day, and um, I, I'm pretty sure I had preached out of Genesis because we were talking about Cain and Abel, and, and he was wondering, you know, what kind of weapon Cain had used to kill his brother, and I said, well, the Bible doesn't tell us, and uh, we talked about possibilities for a while, you know, boys are always fascinated with that type of stuff, and um, he said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God to tell us what 
what Cain used to kill his brother. And you know, I was thinking, man, praise God, we're having rich, deep theological conversation. And, <laughs> and in the next breath, he goes, and when we go to Target, I'm buying Legos. <laughs> we, thank God we still have spiritual conversations. It's been a long time since my son has said to me, hey, you want to go to Target and buy Legos? Although he does still do that, right? <laughs> Just does these like 9,000 piece sets. There's the hope and expectation that there's gonna be growth and maturity. And that's what Paul is saying, the strong need to keep in mind. We, we adapt ourselves to one another, even in those, the, those periods of weakness with a view that as we love and give ourselves in that way, it's gonna result in growth and maturity. I know some of you feel like, will we never move off of these you know, little kid conversations? You will. And even spiritually, sometimes we feel like, are, are we ever gonna make progress out of some of this immature Christian thinking and the conversations we have? Yes, we will. Jesus is calling us to live with a soft heart toward one another, and especially the weak faith believers in our assembly. It's his love that obligates us to one another. Now look at verse three, because there's a second category for us to consider this morning. It's Christ's love that actually serves or sets the standard for loving one another. Isn't this remarkable? Verse three tells us that Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. We've been singing about it all through the morning, but this is what is clearly in view. Paul's actually going back and quoting a psalm here uh, when, when he says, as it is written. Hundreds of years before Paul wrote this letter, the psalmist recorded uh, a conversation prophetically that God the Son was having with God the Father. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. That term reproaches has to do with rude or insulting communication. It's the kind of thing that took place at the cross when Jesus was dying. And if we were to read through Matthew 27, you could begin in, verses, in verse 27 and read through verse 44, you would begin to encounter verbs like this that describe the action and the conversation that the enemies of Jesus were having with reference to him, toward him. They stripped him of his clothing. They mocked him to his face. They spit on him physically. They struck him on the head. They reviled him, Matthew says. They derided him. And all while they were crucifying him. Hundreds of years before that event unfolded, the psalmist saw it by faith, given a prophetic vision, records the conversation, and not just records the event itself, but records how the Son of God, in conversation with God the Father, was saying, those reproaches of these evil people that were against you, I'm making them my own. And he was making them his own in order that we might be delivered from the very sin that was in our hearts when we would reproach him in that way. He bore our reproaches. He took the penalty of those reproaches as he suffered on the cross. There was a real work of redemption underway there. His whole life demonstrates what it means to please the weaker ones as he adapted himself to our weakness by becoming human. We won't get there today, but next week, God willing, there's a, there is a rich thought that unfolds in verses eight and beyond in Romans 15 that, that in this context I think will be quite breathtaking. But here is Jesus adapting himself to our weakness first by becoming human then by living among us, and what a time period he chose to live in. I mean, if you could live in any time period, would, would you go back 2,000 years? So few conveniences, comparatively speaking. Life was hard, and he didn't choose a well-to-do family, prosperous, highly educated, powerful, influential. No, he chose the home of a poor working class carpenter because he didn't come to please himself. 
He came to adapt himself, to please sinners, to rescue us. Living among us, dying in our place, bearing God's wrath, this is part of what it means to to please another. Now, in light of what Christ has done for us at the cross, can we, really to conti- can we really continue to maintain some of the attitudes that Paul had addressed in Romans 14 that we were looking at, passing judgment on one another, one another despising one another? You see, at the foot of the cross, those things suddenly become not just inappropriate, they become offensive. How are those attitudes appropriate to a Lord and Savior who has done all this? And the answer is they're not. So Christ bore our reproaches at the cross. That's what verse three is telling us. Now look at verse four. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So Paul's actually pausing to say, I just quoted uh, this Psalm 69 verse nine for you and I wanna remind you that whatever was written in former days, in this case, several hundred years before Paul wrote this letter, it was written first for our instruction because we need to know truth But here's the purpose, so that through endurance, that's what you and I do, we persevere even in the middle of difficult relationships and challenging circumstances, and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. There are a few reading options in the world today that would would give you some encouragement. Most of it's in the fiction aisle just because it's a diversion for, from a little bit for what's really taking place. It's been a long time since I've read any headline that I would say, now that was encouraging. And motivating me to endure or persevere, again, not gonna find it in the headlines. But God has given us his eternal word not just to instruct us in what is true, but actually to strengthen our hearts and our souls so that we might be people of hope. So endurance or persevering in hardship is what God has called us to do, but we do it because of the word, because he actually continually gives us his eternal perspective and reveals those eternal promises and says, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, this is how it all began, this is how it will all end. And we're trying to figure out where we are on that whole timeline, aren't we? But we see things that God told us long ago will come to pass unfolding right now, and so many of us say, it can't be long before Jesus comes again. But can you imagine living your life with no hope that any rescuer would ever show up? Of course you would be in the street protesting. Of course you would be lobbying in the hallways of the Capitol. Of course you would do whatever you thought possible because no one else is coming to save you. But God has a different message, doesn't he? It doesn't mean that we just sit at home on the couch, you know, playing video games or you know, binge watching Netflix. Oh, Jesus is coming, we're good, pass the popcorn. No, we're highly motivated to work, to serve, to love, uh, to sacrifice. We do all kinds of things, but we have the eternal word, know the plan of God, and that's what motivates us to persevere. Secondly, it's also the thing that encourages us, literally that gives us courage, to instill courage. That's what's encouragement, that's what encouragement is all about. And so the word establishes us in the course of life with the last phrase of this verse, a living hope. And remember the the Christian's hope is a confident expectation for good. That kind of hope never comes from people or circumstances around us. This hope comes only from from the Lord. So Christ gives us hope through his word. Now look at verse five. And Paul breaks into this prayer of blessing, but I actually want you to see this. This is God's heart. This this is what Jesus prays over his church. You say, really? Well, yeah. We know that because he's told us that all scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God. This isn't just Paul's sweet and sentimental thoughts for people that he loves. It's true that he, he genuinely prays this, but this is ultimately sourced in God himself. And so he begins to just pronounce this prayer of blessing, as it were, over the church. Listen to the heart of your Savior. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you, plural, you all, to live in such harmony with one another in accord or that is in relationship with Jesus Christ 
that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks, first of all, of a unity that's expressed in harmony. Live in such harmony. Literally, to, to think as one. Now, musically, uh, most of us have some idea of what harmony is. So there's a melody line, right? And that's what most of us typically end up sing, singing here in a, a setting like this. Uh, but some of you have you know, sung in choirs or maybe even had music lessons or whatever, and you know that there are certain notes uh, both above and below the, the melody line that if you add them in, it, it fills out that tune and may even create a chord if you sing enough notes, but harmony would be those supplemental notes to the melody line that make it richer and fuller. And that's why it's neat to hear some of you uh, I catch little you know, notes here and here that are harmony. Sometimes I try to sing it myself, especially when the melody line goes too high out of my range. I gotta find other options. Well, Paul's not talking specifically about a musical concept of harmony, but that carries us a long way in understanding how in the same way that a melody line is complemented by a harmony line, there is a complementary, uh, complementary relationship in our lives of service to one another, our love for one another, when we actually do the th- individual things that God has called us to. There's a pleasing agreement, if you will. Now, look at the text again, because it's important to know what we are agreeing to. And, and this kind of harmony is not the result of having the same opinion. He's already talked about that in chapter 14, right? And I think the fact that the English translators reflect this distinction in in choosing an English word to translate a Greek text that they chose harmony and they didn't choose, you know, same opinion or agreeing about opinions. No, here's here's the critical phrase. In accord with Christ. That is in relationship to Jesus. Here's the thing that brings first beautiful harmony and then results in unity. That we come together saying Jesus Christ is everything to us. We love him because he first loved us. We submit to him because he is Lord, King of Kings, as we were singing earlier. Uh, We seek his forgiveness because only his blood can cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Only the cross is what rescues us from our sins. It's all about Jesus. Now, the secondary outworking of that may look very different. And again, back in chapter 14, to review very briefly, there were some who were saying, you know, I I can't eat meat that may have been offered to an idol. I think that would dishonor the Lord. And you have other people whose consciences have been strengthened, uh, even through the New Testament writings, where they're like, you know, whether it was or not, I'm not really asking. I just know it's really good meat. And it ultimately came from this God. Both are trying to honor the Lord, but each does it differently. It's actually bringing a kind of spiritual harmony when, because both are seeking to honor Christ, love him, serve him, even obey him, as their consciences have been grown and strengthened, those particular points, those, even those different practices become a beautiful harmony. Because the one thought the one essential, non-negotiable thought is that Christ is Lord. Now, he mentions the word or the concept of, of unity in verses 6 and 7, but look at verse six, with, verse 6 with me, please. That together you may with one voice, together, again, that one-mindedness with one voice, what do we do with that one voice? We glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not here to glorify one opinion above all others. We're not here to glorify one set of scruples of the weak or even the expression of faith that the strong might give. No, we we come together to glorify God the Father. We're honoring Him. We're valuing Him. We esteem Him above all other things. I was actually thinking of another song for this morning uh, until consulting with Andrew. He said, you know, we've never learned that here at Gospel Hope. And I was like, you're kidding me. I mean, in my memory, like 
we sang it a long, long time ago. So we're gonna add another one to the list. Like how soon we'll learn this. But it's, um, the title is Come People of the Risen King. Some of you would know it. Uh, written by Stuart Townen. Uh, I looked it up 2009, so that's an older song. Um, that's humorous to me. Uh, but listen to this text. Come, people of the risen king, who delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts. And what's implied in this text, you tune your hearts to him. You don't just tune them up you know, randomly. We're not even talking musically, but you tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. And morning star is one of those beautiful titles that the Bible has given us for Jesus. Tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. And then in the chorus or the refrain, it has these lines, with one heart, one voice, O church of Christ, rejoice. It's Jesus that gives us that one heart. It's Jesus that gives us that one voice. Now what a contrast this is to the cultural tribalism of our day. You hear that term used a lot as I do, and it's a great term. And we're so divided one from another And there are all kinds of opinions and practices and policies and philosophies that create these individual tribes and one tribe doesn't trust another tribe and doesn't even respect or appreciate the viewpoint of the other tribe. And if we were able, we'd probably destroy every other tribe but our own because we think we're right. What a countercultural thing the church becomes when because of Christ we say, Your background doesn't matter. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. Your gender doesn't matter. Your education doesn't matter. Your citizenship on planet Earth doesn't matter. Jesus matters. He unites us. So that Paul in another place says, in the church, it's not about Jew and Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Christ is all and we are one. So in verse 7, And this wraps it up. Because of all that Jesus is, and because he has called us to harmony and unity, fell behind there, and we're seeking his glory, it simply comes down, look at verse seven, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So we come full circle, all the way back to chapter 14, verse one. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Jesus didn't wait for you to get your act together, for you to grow in in perfect theological understanding, to memorize the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation or to be expert uh, in, in your gospel understanding. He didn't wait for you to be perfectly sanctified where you're not sinning anymore before he welcomed you. No, he actually came after us, as Paul wrote earlier in the book of Romans, when we were without the moral strength to choose him or to choose right when we were hostile enemies toward God, when we were sinners, Christ died for us. So we're not waiting for one another to get our acts together before we unfold our arms and extend them one to another. We welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. You know, in a day when so many people are clamoring for their rights, Christ is calling us to a different mission. And he's actually saying, I I want you to live in order to please others. That means we're giving up some rights here. For gospel hope to be a healthy assembly of God, we walk through these doors and not not with a clinging to our rights, but we, we open our hands and turn loose of so many things and say, you know, I'm not here to claim what's mine. I'm here to love and serve and help others. So let's think this through. How will we live it out? Well, just four takeaways. Bear with the failings of others. It is painful. It's inconvenient. And sometimes it's frustrating. And just like parents say to their little kids, we've talked about this before. I've told you a hundred times. And you know, a faithful parent will tell a child a hundred and one times. We bear with the failings of the weak. We adapt to the weak. That doesn't mean we stay there forever. We're not looking to have an immature church family. We're looking to grow, but it does mean that we, we find the right kind of language to speak. We find the right kind of actions that will connect us 
We love people where they are in order to strengthen them. And even as we seek to strengthen them, we strengthen our hearts in the word of Christ. It's challenging. But this word that God has given us is designed to give you strength day by day, to give you perspective on the world you live in, to give you perspective on the life that he has given to you. And finally, we unite in the work of Christ. We unite in the work of Christ in such a way that the beautiful harmony he spoke of and the unity that he is pushing toward display the glory of God. That's the kind of church he's calling us to be. I actually, again, I'm just so thankful for what God has done here. But I don't want us to be content with where we are. I don't want us to be content with even the the effort that uh, we've made in the past. But God gives us new days and new opportunities, and until he comes, we press forward. I wonder if working through this particular portion of God's word today, if there's been a person or maybe even a couple of people who've come to mind where you've just thought, you know what, that person actually is weak in the faith. Have you taken the next step to say, Lord, how could I help them grow in their faith? How could I speak to them or, or just encourage them to consider some things that, from my vantage point, look like it, it may be suppressing their growth? Maybe you would be that voice of encouragement. Maybe you would be that, that shoulder of, of strength and where you come alongside them and they take a significant step because it's a glorious thing. It's a glorious thing when three-year-olds become 10-year-olds and 10-year-olds become 20 year olds and they're not missing the simple messages in essence saying well the Christian life comes down to this one great truth don't die in the basement and you're like no the Christian life is so much more than that would you pray with me please let's take just a moment to consecrate ourselves to the work that the Lord is calling us to Father these last several weeks in particular have been both a blessing and a challenge and our prayer is that first of all you would strengthen the weak places in our individual hearts and souls that our faith would grow and mature in ways that not only honor you but reflect a mature understanding of your word a mature understanding of your character, and a mature understanding of the mission you've called us to in this life. There's so many around us who do not know Jesus Christ in a saving way. They know about him, heard a few stories of him, but have never really experienced the power of the indwelling spirit of the conviction of sin that leads to repentance and faith. You have called us as your church to be a visible display of the power of Christ to transform individuals and bring them together in a life-giving way. Give us the grace to bear with the failings of the weak around us. And give us the wisdom and creativity to adapt ourselves to these that we love in order that they might be strengthened. And as we trust you, patiently enduring, strengthen our hearts in the word of Christ so that we would be united in the work of Christ. We yield ourselves to you because you are Lord, you are King, You are the only rescuer and savior of the human race. Would you keep your heads bowed in a spirit of prayer for just a moment? I want to extend this offer. If there are things about uh, the study in Romans 15 that have piqued your curiosity or raised questions for you and you would like to have an opportunity to discuss those, I would love to have that privilege. Right after the service, there will be a little break before we go into our 
uh, teaching, another teaching time that lasts about half an hour or so. And we could talk now, or maybe uh, in the coming week, if the schedule would be a little more free for you at another point. I wonder if there's someone here, and I'm not asking this to set you up or embarrass you, certainly. It's part of the reason I've asked people to keep their heads bowed. Is there anyone here today who would say, you know, Pastor Danny, I would love to have a discussion. I do have some questions uh, about the gospel, about Jesus, about the, the word of God that we were in today. Would you just raise your hand that I could see that, and I'll look for you after the service. Thank you. And let's find a time that, that we can talk, maybe, maybe even this morning, which would be great. Anyone else? Say, I, I would love to talk with someone. I'm not the only one here, let me just say that. There are a lot of people who would be very happy to open the word of God again and just talk and share and listen to your questions or thoughts. So Lord, would you please take your word and seal it in truth to our hearts, whatever opinions we have formed outside of your truth, just let them fall away, useless as they are, and I pray that we would retain only those things that come from you. We're so thankful for your word, for all that you are for us, and pray now your blessing as we worship you in this final song. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.